So welcome everyone for today's webinar on Hindu contributions shaping the globe with Dr. DK Hurry and Dr. DK Hemahuri. And so we know Hindu contributions have helped to shape the material progress of humanity and in the realm of mind, which has influenced human thought, sciences, and spirituality through time. But in contemporary times, you know, following the European colonization of India, it's become received knowledge that Hindus were and continue to be ritualistic, superstitious, poverty-ridden, timid, and barely noticeable as a static people whose history is nothing more than the history of successive waves of invaders and colonizers who made India their home for a time. So why did ancient explorers from all around the world seek out the Hindu civilization and for what? So in this webinar, we're going to begin deconstructing the myth set in motion by a 200-year colonial encounter. And before that, we know some of the history, and this course gets into those contributions that have changed the world, examine the evidence for the sciences, technologies, inventions, industry, prosperity, and wealth that made India and Bharat such a de desirable civilization across time. So we're going to get into all of that in today's webinar. Thank you, everyone, for joining. If you haven't yet put in the chat where you're Zooming in from, please do. Dr. Kumar from Plano, Texas, glad to have you on. Kashyap and Shraddhaji from Indianapolis, welcome, welcome. Yep, yep, uh, webinar attendees, yes, your video and audio is off, so don't worry about that. Uh, you do you while you listen and uh, enjoy this webinar. We got Prashant Amaraji from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Great to have you on. Shashi Ji from Austin, Texas. Welcome, welcome. And with that, let me introduce our speakers, uh, faculty, our esteemed guests, our thought leaders, uh, just some wonderful people, Dr. DK Hari and Dr. DK Hemahari. They actually started Bharat Nyan Initiative in Civilizational <laughs> Studies back in the year 2000. And they've been following an interdisciplinary approach to researching India from an Indian perspective. And they've been providing an integrated Indic narrative on the Indian civilization. And their studies and their exploration has taken them around the world. They might tell you some of that in this webinar, the story of them going to CERN and seeing that kind of stuff. And they've been working with Hindu University of America for many quarters now, teaching a whole range of courses and even have their own certificate program, a whole chronology of courses. Um, and it is always an honor and a pleasure to have the hurries on uh, Hindu University of America for a webinar. So let me hand it over to them for uh, to get us started and uh, enjoy. Thank you, I'll be here in the background. Thank you, Dr. Hurry, Dr. Hurry. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Patel, for uh, introducing us so nicely, uh, as usual, in a very effervescent manner. That's nice, and it's much appreciated. And as uh, you so rightly said, we have done so many quarters of uh, sessions with uh, Hindu University of America. And each one has been an enriching session for us as faculty, as much as it has been for the students of the course through the last few years. And uh, the good part is all these uh, webinars, the recordings are available in HUA website, YouTube channel, as well as in Bharatgan YouTube channel for all to go and watch because each one of them adds on the earlier one. So it's sort of cumulatively giving more and more knowledge. So that will equip ourselves. And obviously all these webinars lead to course proper wherein we can well on these subjects in a very detailed manner with a lot of interactions, many, many questions and answers. So that is the beauty of the course that we conduct. Yes, as uh, Mr. Ankur Patil so rightly said, we have our own certificate program of Hindu civilization studies of which this quarter and this whole course is a part of. It's actually, a, as she says, as she uses the word, Dr. Hema uses the word, it's a Hop on, hop off. You can join in the quarters that you're comfortable with. Take that and then take a break if you want and then come back. So it, it's a very flexible uh, way the program has been designed to meet your requirements to your facilities and your faculty. So, so that way it's been designed. 
and uh, apart from our sessions of uh, talking in the sessions, we also have a lot of reading material, course material, films to view. Banner. So we, we have a whole package that we offer you so that it, it's more wholesome. And uh, obviously, we also have quiz questions that's easy to take. As one of one member said, it's so easy to take these quiz questions after listening to your sessions that are so heartening to hear because it may, the idea is to learn. The idea is to enjoy the process of learning about our glorious civilization as a whole. And I'll leave to Dr. Hema to take it forward from here. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Ankur, uh, for uh, hosting this beautiful webinar. And uh, we have got so many people from different places. It's such a joy to see a uh, diverse uh, audience. And uh, as today's webinar goes, it is about Hindu contributions shaping the globe. And uh, the question will first be... Cheers. So, did they really shape the globe? And if so, in what manner? What were these contributions that have actually shaped the globe? So, like uh, Ankur just gave you the introduction, uh, we have been under this myth, which continues to cloud many of our minds, that uh, both uh, Indians in India, Indians abroad, as well as uh, people uh, in the rest of the world, that Indians are more superstitious, they are more religious, spiritual, and if at all they have contributed, it is mainly in the realm of yoga, spirituality, and uh, that's where their idea about the Hindu civilization stops. But if you really delve, you will find that the world is what it is today. The, the way it is today, the things we deal with, our lifestyle, everything, there is a lot that is owed to the contributions from the Hindu civilization. And that is something that will really change the perception of the Hindu civilization. And we will see in a little while, why should this perception change? Why is it needed at all? I mean, all this has been in the past, all right. So what, what does it matter today? Today we are fine, we are here somewhere. Let's move forward. Why should I know about it? So that is again something that we will see in today's session and the reason to the why and the details we'll be seeing in the course because in this one hour, this is a real long list to cover. So to set the stage as such, you know, the world stage in the 1980s, uh, how was it? So there was this uh, Western belief that uh, the developed nations have always been rich. And so the, the world as it existed in 1980s, like the developed nations then and the underdeveloped nations then. So the idea was that the developed have always been rich and the underdeveloped have always been poor. And uh, that was a perception. And these kind of myths were actually shattered by one economic historian by the name Paul Bayrock, who kind of started drawing attention of America and Europe to their practice of industry, trade, and economics. And in that context, he showed how many of the countries that were colonized actually were in a much better state uh, than even Europe and uh, America was even in the 1980s. So the kind of uh, prosperity and flourish that they had enjoyed was much, much higher. So look at this. So as recently as till 40 years ago, there was a huge misconception in the, in the world thought, which primarily means European thought and American thought and economic thought that it was the West that was the economic powerhouse and has been so for centuries and centuries. And the rest of the world had pretty much depended upon them. Whereas there was this person who questioned it and actually with this book, you see, he calls it myth and paradox. He breaks out these factors. When he brought it out, people did not believe him. They did not believe that what he says could be true. So what did they do? They they had an organization called Organization for Economic and Cooperation and Development, OECD. And in this, 
they got an economic historian of those times by name Angus Madison to do a study and find out whether what Paul Byrock says is right or wrong. And more important, not to say right or wrong, more important to say that he is wrong. So they did. So this Angus Madison person was actually a xenophile. What is a xenophile? The way you have Indophile, people who have a good feeling towards India, people who are uh, sort of towards India. A xenophile is one S-I-N-O. Xenophile is one who is more towards China. Sino China. So that's what he was. So he was engaged by OECD to do a what, what he called as a millennial report. That is not for 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, but for 2000 years. It was called a millennial report because of millennia one, millennia two. So uh, of course, now we all, we all know we are living in the third millennia. So he was asked to do this report, which is what he said, to set the context right. And what did he do? What is the finding that is relevant to us in his report is what we see. When he came up with this World Economic Report, a, a, a millennial perspective, look at this. He, he found that in the year 1 CE, in the year 1 CE, he found that India was number one in world GDP share. So almost one third of the world GDP was India. Then China was one fourth. And other, uh, and uh, the, what you call the Middle East for them now, that is West Asia for, for the Indians, uh, was, was one fifth. And 10% and was Europe. And like that, it was flowing. So that's how it made up. So this was how the... And this was, look at this. So Eastern Europe is 1.8%. Western Europe is 10%. So totally putting up to about 12% was the GDP of Europe then. Then going on from there, and North America and Australia put together is not even 1%. That was the GDP or GDP ratio then. Then if you look, come, come forward by 1,000 years, Still, India holds almost 30% and China slightly picking up there. Whereas Middle East is there and Western Europe and all that. See, again, the, the ratio isn't much changed, but Africa has moved a little more at best. That's all. India has dropped because of attacks from the near West. You can see that. And you come forward by another 500 years, to the 1,500, China has overtaken India marginally. Whereas India is still one-fourth of the world. That's because of the Continuous attacks from the near west for the last couple of centuries then. Eh? And if you look at it's only then slowly. Now you've got countries like Italy, France, Russia, Germany, all that having the individual GDPs. Before it was just one combined GDP of Western Europe. That's what it was. So is so that's when first time we start seeing a number for the United Kingdom as 1.1%. Look at the ratio of comparison. This is before the British had found India before the colonization of India. That's just about the time. Then 100 years later, look at this, this is at the start of the colonization. And this is at the peak of the Mughal rule. India drops and China goes up. India clearly drops to a second place and, and China is almost 30% of world trade. That's when United Kingdom also, which has just about started its trade with India, comes to 1.8%. Then you come to, this is when really United Kingdom has sort of stepped in. Actually, if you look at this period, 1700, it's the Maratha rule period. And India pulls back. And now comes number one. Because this is the post-Mughal, pre-colonial period. It is a Maratha period. It's the Maratha India. Maratha Confederacy. So India pulls back and comes to one-fourth of the world trade again. Pulls ahead of China. That's when the British are, are setting up trade in India. Their trade office is in India, so they come to about 2.93%. You see that. But if you look from there in another uh, century at 1820, look at this. It's the colonial India, proper British India. And that's when the real drop starts happening. This is about 200 years from the present. And China's, because of which, China just pulled through. They just pulled ahead. And United Kingdom comes to 5% trade. Look at how the world trade moves then. And you come to 1870s, 150 years back. Look at this. It's a British India and United Kingdom that collectively occupy 
one fifth and more of the world trade, and, and China has dropped by then. That's when look at this other countries like Americas and all that start getting two percent trade. Okay, United States by itself has got nine percent. The first time you're seeing that nine percent world trade, UK. So it's equivalent there. Okay. Now you come to the 1900s. That's about a hundred years ago. US is absolutely pulled pulled forward, where others are starting dropping, and India is dropping down. And both put together, India and United Kingdom, that's British India and United Kingdom, collectively come to about 15% of world trade. So, so that's why the, look at the churn happening, the movement happening. This is 1950 after independence. Because in, see, so United States has, has just pulled through the position that what India was a millennia ago. And Soviet Union has emerged after World War II as the next big power. And United Kingdom, because it has lost the crown in the jewel, India, it's dropped to, jewel uh, the jewel in the crown, it's dropped to, six, to the fifth place and India has further dropped. Look how it's moving. And you come to 50 years ago, again, US and the Soviet Union have got the preeminence of place and UK has further dropping because it's, it's lost that whole colonial power lead and India is dropping because of its erroneous socialist policies which is keeping in which is shackling India from growing forward. That's what has happened because it shackles because the policies are not native to the land. It's imported policies that are not helping India to rejuvenate again. That's what is the problem there. And we look at now about 20 years ago, India slowly coming back. India is again overtaken UK and coming back whereas uh, USA is right at the top and look at this now it's the Middle East that's come up because of the oil trade right? because of oil trade so see how the world economics moves now having said this let's look at the Indian concept that is the focus of our course here so it, just in comparison we'll show you quickly for a moment how India's prosperity by itself what it was top of the world literally, and how when it was colonized, it just dropped. And post-colonization, the orange-yellow line is obviously India, and the blue line is uh, Britain, how it came up and fell down, where India is now climbing back. Now the point is, what is it that makes for this timeline prosperity position of the land of civilization of Bharat? That's what you have to see. Based, this is based on this report. So the question then will arise, what constituted this high GDP? Now this discussion, this uh, Angus Madison's report has been in discussion for the last decade or so. But have we ever gone to understand what gave India this high GDP? What were the products? What were the enablers for this production? What was the component of trade? And how did all this impact the world at all? So these are some of the questions that we need to ask. So we see very clearly that the Hindu civilization, because one CE onwards, we're talking about the Hindu civilization and there, there definitely was wealth because we can see this from Angus Madison's report. And we can see that it is trade that is also the source for this wealth. And this trade could not have happened if it, were, it, if it was not for manufacture or industry which was the source for this trade. And when you delve then into what was this industry, you will find that there are five major components that contributed to the, the trade that was happening from India. Of course, we all, if we ask anybody, if we just tap somebody and say, do you know what India was famous for Indian trade? The answer will obviously always be spice. But if you also look, you will see that when uh, the uh, Columbus, when uh, travelers such as uh, Vasco da Gama, Columbus, they go in search, they go in search of India. And Vasco da Gama is lucky enough to find India, the sea route to India. And he says that he sees ships that were far larger, almost 10 times larger than his ship. So with such large ships, were they trading only in spices would then be the question. So let's have a look at what were these big five.
and you know europe i mean what actually prompts vasco da gama or columbus to go in search of india you will find that in 12 late 1200s there was this uh, traveler marco polo who travels all over asia and on his way back he comes across uh, he comes to the coast of india malabar actually he touches malabar and then goes back and then writes a book a best seller of 1300s and in this he it's called the travels of marco polo and in this he talks about the fabulous wealth and splendor of india so mind you he has traveled over all of asia and then his book actually talks a lot about the wealth and splendor of india and he talks about everything in millions he says millions of precious gems millions of gold coins millions of miles of fertile country millions of amazing people so much so that he got dubbed as marco milli so everybody instead of calling him marco polo they said he is marco milli because everything was milli milli because in uh, european languages million is milli so ma everything was milli so he was also marco milli and they refused to believe that this could be so that a land could be so prosperous because we should recall here that in the early 1300s europe was slowly coming out of a thousand years of dark ages now what is dark ages i'm sure all of you those who know find those who don't know please go and check it out it's a thousand year battle between christendom and the pagan thought and and mind you if a continent is going through a thousand year battle what is the state of economy of the continent so they couldn't believe that a place could be as prosperous as india as peaceful as india as fertile as india that with so much gold coins I mean, so that was that was what was the imagery that was given about india and so people started looking for india everywhere and finally vasco da gama find for the sea route to india so what was they looking for they looking for india all over the world because we'll see the details in the course per se they looking for india in the east in as east indies they're looking for india in the west as west indies they're looking for indonesians they're looking for india in the far east indonesia so basically what was the like in the english language you have known the proverbial pot of gold at the end of a rainbow that was what the europeans were looking for the way today the world is europe or america centric then the world was india centric not for a century or two but for millennia more than two millennia So what are we looking for? So we always hear about spices and treasure. We haven't really been told what this treasure actually was, and it was an inexhaustible treasure trove. Oh, wisdom too. So if you look at these treasures, they were actually iron and steel, zinc, cotton, indigo, and sugar and spices. Not only spices, and you can see this see, to uh, create this picture you have to go into various aspects none of this is given anywhere in one single source you have to really go through diverse sources and then you will find for instance if you look at iron and steel it goes way back in 325 326 bce when alexander comes to india and he returns from india he doesn't ask for gold as a gift from india he actually asks for indian steel and takes back indian steel from india so that shows you that the steel was valued a lot more than even gold would you believe that steel was valued lot more than gold till recently and very very uh, interestingly we all know that india has large reserves of gold even as of today and much of the wealth of india which has already been plundered a lot of the gold from india has already gone out we'll be seeing the reasons why all of this happened but for all this india does not have many gold mines so where did india get this gold no wonder alexander did not ask for gold because gold is not a produce of this land it is something that this land has accumulated this hindu civilization had accumulated by way of trade of all so, these so products so accumulated product that is not grown in that is not grown or mined in your own country it must be traded and gold being one of the most precious tradable commodities 
how can a land accumulate so much gold have an appetite for gold have a liking for gold if you do not have products that attract gold so we'll we'll just show you a Look very very keyword, interesting products that attract gold so we'll show you a very interesting uh, short film uh, and we have many of these kind of small films to show uh, during our course uh, i'll just show you this uh, particular it just it's a totally lateral thought so if you see there are the big five you know when you look at africa they talk about the big five game the elephant the bison the rhino the lion and the uh, cheetah and uh, if you talk to human resources personnel they'll talk about the big five traits that are very essential when they look for uh, aspirants likewise we have had five major pro produce from the hindu civilization and since we spoke about iron and steel and alexander not asking for gold let us just uh, look at this uh, film the audio is not coming through the video can you reshare with the share audio button uh, sorry, are you not able to uh, hear? Yeah, we cannot hear. Can so maybe reshare and click. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm button. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Need the audio. Yeah, the audio is on. This is quote by a person by name Thomas Carlyle. He's a Scottish philosopher, historian, mathematician, teacher of the Victorian era of England. He, he makes a speech in Manchester where he makes a very clear statement. A nation which controls, gains control over iron, soon acquires control of gold. It's a very strong statement observation he makes. Because India was a manufacturer of iron and steel for the world for 2000 years and more. So all the gold was flowing into India. Those big ships that were navigating, they're actually carrying a whole lot of iron from India to the rest of the world. In a way, if you see much of the wars in Europe, which were fought between the Christendom and the Islamic world, the Arabs. So, you know, you had all the Crusades, the Dark Ages, and uh, the swords of the Arabs. For both sides, for both the armies, India supplied the steel swords. So, the famous Damascus sword and all the, all were supplied by India. So, we were the arms supplier of the world for nearly 2000 years. So you can imagine that the range of industrialization that was there in India. So country which controlled the iron, controlled the gold. After it moved from India, what happened? The country that controlled the iron went to England and Europe. So the wealth went to Europe, period of the colonization. So the shift of manufacture went from India to Europe. Then what happened? From the start of the 1900s, the shift of manufacture of iron and steel went from Europe to America. So all the gold moved towards United States of America, the manufacture of steel, huge mega steel plants happened there. Then what happened after World War II, Japan started manufacturing steel in a big way, importing raw material, raw ore from India. We have mentioned that in our book, Indo-Japan, how India agreed to supply, continuous supply of iron ore to Japan. So the Japanese steel industry really flourished. So Japan steel became famous. Because India's only country that agreed to supply iron ore to Japan. So all the shifting happened towards Japan. 1980s onwards, who became the steel manufacturer of the world? China. So all the gold shifted to China. Look at how the pattern moves across few centuries. This, this one statement tells you a story of how industrialization has moved, how the gold has also moved, how the economy has moved. So this is an important parameter for us. Having seen here how gold follows steel and how india was the largest steel manufacturer for centuries and millennia and also the largest repository of gold of the world in this era of new india we see that india is by far 
the largest manufacturer of iron ore and what is interesting to note here is that 50 percent of the iron ore that india manufactures is exported with the make in india policy that this new india has undertaken if we can once again ensure that most of the iron ore that india brings out is utilized within india itself to make steel products both for indian consumption as well as for export to the countries across the world we can once again as a land attract the gold of the world and make india prosperous so actually this such a lateral uh, shift in thought and perception we always think that it is gold which will uh, you know everything will follow the gold but it is actually gold which keeps following all these commodities and the the reason we showed you that last bit as well about the present state of india is to show the importance of manufacture of industry which the Hindu civilization had practiced very well. So it is that value addition which is more important. It is very important. And uh, it's not just the raw materials alone. So today we are exporting a lot of iron ore, but it, in earlier days, it was the finished product. And along with that, it was actually, when you say a finished product and that product was in demand, it also speaks about the state of technology, the state of skills, and the discipline of industry as well. So all of this is what was the highlight of the uh, Hindu civilization of uh, those times. And this is with respect to uh, iron as uh, we see. Uh, similarly, uh, you have very interesting aspects about cotton as well. Let me take a time to yes. Maybe I can just show you a small uh, clip on the cotton tool. Hi. Have you been Sorry. Business ka email ID bhi S. Regarding Indian cotton, there's a wonderful story here. We all know a subject called history. All of us are aware of that. Where does this word history itself come from? It comes from a book called Historia. The, in, the word that we subject that we use history comes from the word Historia, which is a book. And this book is authored by a Greek scholar by the name Herodotus, who lived around 400 BCE. That's about 2400 years before our present times. And he writes many wonderful things in this book. In that, among the various things he observes, he makes a very poignant statement here. What does it say regarding cotton? He says here, in India, there are plants that produce the sheep's wool. Obviously, he is referring to cotton plants. Look at this. So that means what? The Greeks and the civilizations around them, the European civilization was not aware of cotton plant. And for them, their primary form of clothing was from sheep wool. So they were surprised that there is a plant in India that grows this product which is similar to sheep's wool, the fluffy sheep's wool. That's why he very clearly says here, there are plants in India that produce sheep's wool. They tells us many stories about the story of cotton, how India offered cotton to the world, India shared cotton to the world and it spread all over the world from there on. So India is the home to cotton. So here we very clearly see, so we should be two samples here. One is about steel, other is about cotton. So among the big five, we have shown you two, like that each one of them have got wonderful factors. We will bring out through this uh, 10 session course on the quantum of trade, just huge by any world standard. Which is why we, we chose to call them the big five, because when you go through the uh, data about this civilization, you will find that these are products which had a large volume of trade was going on in these products. They contributed to a lot of wealth with this civilization. 
and these are products which have actually influenced the rest of the globe yes so so spices is yes i mean it has uh, fuel the taste and so on but these big products actually influenced the practices the eating everything that the thought the living the practices the rituals everything of the world have had a huge influence from the hindu might and the indian produce that we can see that's why we, uh, she said we call it the big five certainly that which changed the world that shaped the world that's what we'll be seeing in this process so what we have uh, therefore done is we have taken these hindu contributions and we have segregated them into two those contributions which have been in the realm of matter those contributions which have been in the realm of mind many of you must be aware of so many of the aspects in science and philosophy maths and so on which have uh, gone from the hindu thought uh, and hindu literature to the west so uh, and further we look at these the contributions in the realm of matter for instance we have Uh, looked at them as what were the products, the facts. Then, what caused the? I mean, the the globe, the changes in the globe. How did it change? What were the game changers, both for the Hindu civilization? So, what were the factors that caused the Hindu civilization to flourish in these, to manufacture, to trade, and as well as sustain the uh, flourish? as well as what were the game what was the game changer that later on caused the west to uh, adopt and uh, increase and move in this direction and also how did the game change and and move from the east to the west so all of this the story of this is what we will be seeing in a, another course as well which follows this particular quarter So sure. likewise in the realm of mind we have one which looks at uh, sciences and arts and we look at the contributions in living and lifestyle as well so it's actually what hema show you is a four quarters that succeed one after another the first this quarter is the big five the quarter that succeeds this will be the game changer which is again be 10 sessions which will be followed by the in the realm of mind quarters again that is split into two so we show you a wholesome contribution of the hindu society to the world at large in shaping the world so in these 10 sessions we'll actually be looking at uh, so what are the symbols and signs that really talk about the hindu prosperity what have been the trade contributions what have been the inventions all the way from vedic times you will see a history or trail of inventions sequence of inventions one leading to another to another to another it's a continuous sequence it's a trail as she so rightly says then we look at these big five the metals the alloys the textiles the dyes the diamonds sugar spices and so on so and, those are the ten sessions that we're looking at and all of this actually uh, so when we look at the hindu civilization there are two aspects one is to understand the hindu civilization from uh a perspective of what is today called as hinduism so we have four sets of courses which we uh, where we look at that perspective and these four which talk about the contributions from this particular civilization because put together actually they give you a very good understanding about the ethos of the civilization and uh, like we said you know how do you gain an understanding of the ethos of the civilization in practicing their industry the trade and this gives you a insight into seeing dharma in practice itself because when we look at all this and we try to understand the game changer we will see how dharma has influenced these industries and the trade and more uh, fundamentally we will gain valuable lessons on sustainability we just wondered right why go the uh, i mean learn about all this which has happened in the past it's more to understand and gain lessons on sustainability for the future because this is a civilization which is continuously living it has uh, flourished it has sustained we saw from angus madison's report for almost more than 2000 years it has been uh, the leading uh, contributor for world trade so that means it had sustained its industry it had sustained its trade it had sustained its wealth 
And, and how do we know it had sustained wealth? Very simple. This civilization, if you look at it, I'll just show you this uh, very interesting piece as well. We always talk about the uh, Hindu civilization having been plundered multiple times, right? So the first has been a wave of invasions from the near west. So we can categorize all these invasions into three waves. One wave, which is from the near west. One which came Oops. over the seas from oh, Europe, from far, the colonial invasion. And then the third, after independence also, there still has been a lot of plunder of the wealth of India and uh, being sent from within India overseas. So we can look at these, uh, the, the plunder of India itself in three uh, different ways. Now, when you see that some particular group of people are being plundered again and again, for instance, if there is a thief, he comes to a, a house and he robs and goes away with the wealth and comes again a week later to rob, that means he knows that the vault is going to be filled up in this interim gap of one week that this group of people are, this house is going to be able to fill up their vault again in one week. Refill. Refill. So that is what has happened. So when we say that this civilization had sustained wealth, that means, and that is why they were repeatedly plundered. They had so much of wealth. They had the key to prosperity. To so learn the key to prosperity is also another important lesson that will come out of uh, an understanding of these contributions. And mind you, with all this, they had also sustained ecology. So there was no uh, uh, major uh, issues about pollution. We have had the rivers continuously flowing till about a uh, few decades ago. So in spite of Indian civilization contributing to one third to one fourth of the world trade for not decade or two decades or five decades or a century, but for 20 or more centuries, that's two millennia and more, we have not had the issue of spoiling the environment. That issue was never there in the in, in the thought because we were we had a sustainable uh, methodology of keeping the ecology, environment, and economic. So it was an eco eco model, as we'll see. We balanced economy with ecology. So that's where a good environment. That's a very Hindu thought. It's all coming now in the Western world and speaking about it in the form of environment and global warming in the last two, three decades. But we actually, we spoke, not only just spoke about it, we put it into practice for two millennia. So which better land, which better civilization, which better group of people to consult with and take the points of advice than the Hindu Indian civilization for this purpose, which has actually put into practice this ecological system of prospering economy. That's the beauty of it. And that we, that's what we need to bring forth for people to leverage their strengths from. And uh, this is what we're going to be uh, covering in this course. Uh, you can go to hua.edu and uh, you can... Uh, so if you go here, you will see that... Uh, hmm. that's a so under the Continuing Education Division, you will find this... Uh, certificate in Hindu Civilization Studies. So you can click on this and uh, you will be taken to the page where all the courses are here. I will also take you to this page to show you how this, uh, this is from the Bharat Gyan website, the Hindu Civilization Studies program here. So like uh, we told you in the beginning, it's a hop on, hop off circular program of eight courses over eight quarters or two years. And uh, so, like I said, four courses on exploring Hinduism. So looking at the aspects of Hinduism, the characteristics and traits, and here you see it in practice through the contributions that the Hindus have made to the world. So these are the Hindu contribution set of four courses. So you could join anytime you can join for the entire certificate and do it sequentially from wherever you start you can do it. I mean, there is no nothing like which is a, a prerequisite. You can start anywhere and complete the whole cycle in two years to get your certificate. Or if you choose to do it in between, then it'll take you a little longer. But the moment you complete eight, you will get your certificate. 
So that is uh, about the course. And uh, so I shall uh, no, 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 give it back. The film uh, slide, which... Yes. And also this particular course, as we go through, uh, there are books that uh, we, we have uh, used to form the basis for the course, which are part of our Autobiography of India series, which is predominantly the Brand Bharat series. This is from our website. Bharat and these Bharat. books are there on the Bharat Gyan website, as well as Breaking the Myths set of books. But what we've also done is to keep your uh, reading focused. We have also compiled them as reading material for each of the courses. And uh, so you will have an online reading material which comprises of extracts from all these books. And we give you the cover of the books as well to tell you where it is coming from. For example, for uh, topic symbols and signs of Hindu prosperity, how it was a global brand, from which book we have taken. So like that, we keep the context uh, going for you. And also uh, we have a lot of films like those couple of films that we watched, we also have a lot of films that you can uh, watch. A whole host of films for you to watch and learn a lot more from the course. It's not just uh, didactical where we talk, talk, talk for 19 snow. We pepper it with so much, of course, uh, I mean, uh, with reading as well as for viewing films so that it makes it much more lively and interesting. And even more important is interactive. When we take in all questions and answers, that's how the course has been designed. So let, let's all come together and enjoy the course and, and do this. Okay. There's a question here from. Yeah, I think we will hand it over to Ankur and he can uh, now uh, decide how he wants to take this forward. Thank you, Ankur. Now Thank that was you. amazing. Always a pleasure. And I see how you continue to add and iterate and develop the presentation. So if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box. We'll get to all of your questions. And even though it's a webinar, we're still going to make this interactive in the class. It's a Zoom meeting where you can see everyone who wants to turn on their camera. And uh, again, the hurries take all of the questions and they spend the time. And it's just an amazing course. Uh, two for one, right? You get two amazing, intelligent people <laughs> teaching. And uh, and we've designed this in a way in the, the fee structure so that it is good for parents and grandparents to take it with their kids yes. and their grandchildren. Yeah. So if you add a registration, it's only $100 more. So I've dropped the links to the course. Uh, it's going to start July 8th. It's going to end September 16th. It's going to be on Saturdays at 11 a.m. Eastern. And we've said it's supposed to end at 1230, but I think it usually goes a little bit longer. But um, that's the time of this one class. And then under that, I put the link to the certificate in Hindu civilizational studies. So the whole certificate program where you can get plugged into. So, yes, Dr. Divya, I agree. It was such a pleasure. Um, and if I haven't given you a shout out yet and you'd like to let us know where you're zooming in from, if you have some comments, Vikram Ji from Phoenix. Always glad to have you on. Uh, I know a stalwart student and a supporter of the, the hurries. Um, so let's get some Thank questions. You. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Yeah, and uh, I'll launch a poll real quick. We got Dilipji, of course. Always a pleasure to have you from Maryland, another regular. So the, the one question that somebody put in the Q&A box is from Kashyap Ji, who's asking, why did science research go down in India after uh, thousand, 1,000 common era and came up in the West. What was that uh, transfer about? Very good question, Kashyapji. See, that's because, see, what you need, one of the important things for science is obviously continuous flow of money for research. Patronage. Patronage from the right people. And what you need is some amount of peace in the land. You cannot be doing research on science when a uh, land is war stricken. In fact, this is the reason why Europe went into dark ages. For thousands of years, it was war struck. So there couldn't be any progress there. And which is why you had to have the Renaissance. And that is when science started. And when we do the Hindu contributions in the realm of mind, we will see how this Renaissance was fueled by a lot of contributions from the Hindu civilization. 
So, but for Renaissance in Europe, you would not be having development of science in Europe. Isn't it? So that was a key period. Similarly, when you had attacks from the near Western India from around the year 1000 in, in, the, in the second millennium, obviously science, among many things that take hit, science also takes a hit. Naturally. And it is mentioned intrinsically in the, in the works itself that science takes a big hit. Because your centers of learning are, are, are burned. Nalanda was burned. Takshasila was burned. Vikramashila was burned. Mathura was burned. So many science centers in Somnath, there was a huge university that was burned. Now you're suddenly rebuilding back university in Somnath. Each one of these were burnt down. So science obviously takes some hit. Because the centers of learning, the centers of research, which are scientific centers, take a hit. Obviously. But natural. That's why science shifted to south. If you see calculus, which the modern world is so proud of, actually came from Kerala, which was less hit. By the so it was only in the 1400s, 1500s, the Madhava series came up, the scientist by name Madhava, which from there went on with the Jesuit priest to, to Europe and evolved as calculus. That's how it just happens. So that's but natural. It's a natural corollary to the question of Shant, peace, Shanti, essential. That's why you have three types of Shanti. You say Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. You need that for progress of science. All three shantis you need. Right, beautiful. And uh, the connection to kind of uh, Anil Ji's question in the chat is, how did the, the Europeans manage to fool Indians for the last 400 years? What was wrong with this? Let's put that on pause for a second. Put your questions in the Q&A box before we get into that, because I know that's one thing that comes up often. Uh, let me launch the poll about this course in particular. Are you interested? Yeah. Are you interested in enrolling in Hindu contributions shaping the globe? Let us know. Yes, definitely. If you have questions, yes, but you have questions maybe later. If you can't take this course, maybe another one in a following quarter. No, either way, just let us know. It makes it easier for us to follow up. And as this course is focused on Hindu contributions and that shape the globe. We, HUA has so many courses and so many aspects. And kind of, Anilji, your question, it's not a, what was wrong with us. How did they fool us? Colonialism. We haven't gone through a proper decolonial period. We have a whole area of study on post-colonial Hindu studies, right? It's not necessarily what's wrong with us. It's what does colonization do, right? It's not just taking the resources and extracting the steel and the gold and the resources in the big five. It's also colonizing the mind, right? The philosophical systems, the ideas, imprinting what their uh, knowledge systems are onto our systems, replacing. And so there's so many layers to that. Um, and we get into deep conversations about that in, in definitely some other courses. But I'll, of course, hand it over to our... Uh, faculty today to maybe take a quick uh, response to that. And if you can, please put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll go through all of your questions. All right, let me hand it to you to take a shot at that question. See, fooling people is actually easy. <laughs> it's actually quite easy because most marketeers, because I, I am a person who has done marketing in MBA marketing, so I know. So it's only, it's a, it's a lot of uh, uh, what do you call knowing how to speak, what to say, and to sort of convince people that apart as a on a lighter way. Actually, you have a saying, you no, know, to be a good marketer, you should know how to sell a fridge or ice to an Eskimo, which many people have done. So, having said that, what what happened? Let's look at it from the, apart from the humor. Let's look at serious. When you have a civilization that's been battered for 500, 600 years already and just coming to a renaissance of the Maratha period and the Vijayanagar period, the, the whole renaissance happening and coming back, okay, you have a second wave happening within a gap of 100 years. And that hits even more. And this wave happened where the interest in trade while the first wave was interested in control and hegemony and also theological control, 
The second wave was primarily first only trade. So it's an infusion of trade where they're going right into each center and trying to, and that led to colonization of areas to control. So the methodology was different. Was used. So to understand there are two different methodologies used by two different genres of people to control the land. Here it was primarily more economic, then it became political. And, and the point I would like to add here is also the fundamental difference between how the Hindu civilization used to practice trade. What was meant by trade for the Hindu civilization? And that is something that we'll be touching in this course. And they, they obviously were caught totally unawares of, uh, by the philosophy of trade that the uh, colonial powers were coming with. So there was a total mismatch. So they really couldn't fathom that trade would happen from this perspective. Here, see, the, the Hindu system of trade was to be noble, to trade in a noble way. Whereas the European system of trade was buyer beware. Fundamentally, two different concepts of trade. We'll discuss this when we do trade. We obviously, it's part of the course bit where we show you the examples because now in the webinar, we can give you the headline points. So it's a two different concepts of trade. It's actually black and white. When we went to trade, when the Hindus went to trade all over the world, they said, Krinvanto Vishwamari, let's make the world a noble place. When the Europeans came here to colonize, they said, let us scrap the bottom and take everything that we can, loot everything that we can. So that's a, it's, it's a mind shift change happening. We wanted to be noble, whereas they wanted to be absolutely grasp everything possible. It's, it's two different dialogues, two different mindsets. We'll deal with it in the course with examples. Okay? Yes, please. Yes, back to you, Uncle. Wow, that was heavy right? Just the two different kinds of trade, right? I hadn't actually thought about it, but intuitively, yeah, that's kind of obviously what has been happening. But again, this is why you need to take the course. The Dr. Hurry and Dr. DK Hurry, Dr. Hema Hurry, they just articulate so many points so well, better than I could, of course. That's why I'm not teaching the course and they are. Um, Vikram Ji, Vikram Sachin says, Dr. Hema and Dr. Hurry are amazing professors. The classes are interesting and engaging. You will love the course. Dr. Divya says, but you know what? India is bouncing back and will shine on top <laughs> in the very end. And that's what Hindu University of America is about. Not just the India focus, but uh, uh, that, again, that global perspective. How do we be, bring our knowledge and wisdom to the world with that noble perspective, right? There's so many different cliches, Vasudev Kutumbikam, Vishwaguru. We're humbly doing our part at Hindu University of America. So please do take this course. If you haven't filled out the poll, let us know. Uh, the link is still in the chat. Um, click register. Uh, the course again starts in July, on July 8th. You have enough time to get ready, get signed in, all those sorts of things. And again, our learning management system, the online access, we make it easy. We want people to participate and engage because this is such an important initiative such an important endeavor. I don't see other questions in the chat. Let me share just one thing with you. Uh, I, was, I was asked to do this, but please you know, follow us on social media. If you haven't yet, go to, if it's Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or YouTube, whatever you're using, go there, look for us at study at HUA and follow us, engage, share the videos, comment, let people know that you are at least attending the webinar. And if you've taken a course, share it out there. We're really making that push. So please do take that moment to go to the social media, follow study at HUA, follow Bharat Nyan. That's our, our, the Dr. Hurry specific uh, social media handle. They have, they're engaged. They're engaged on the webinars. They engage in the courses. They engage in social media. And uh, it's just a pleasure to be a part of this. So uh, with that, let me hand it back to you from some maybe closing thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, we'd like to thank you for giving this opportunity once again to, to meet all of you. And thank you for so many of you to have, have come on to this uh, webinar and asked uh, more than a couple of pertinent questions, which we hope we have been able to answer to the, your satisfaction because we answer straight from a heart based on the facts that we have on hand. 
uh, and without any filters, basically. And uh, that's how we, we, we will like to engage with all of you in the course. We certainly urge you to join the session so that we can interact more. And all of us benefit from this knowledge jointly. We also benefit a lot based on the questions you ask us. That helps us to think. While we may have a repository of research points with us, these questions help us to trigger our thoughts, to collect them all together and present it to you as in the course directly. So we prepare and come to you a week later. It's all extempore at the moment of the cuff, which with the facts that we've been able to, we have, we've been glad to, we've been fortunate to collate over the last two and a half decades and more and bring them out in the form of books, articles, films, banners, and now these courses. So we have a variety of ways of dissemination of, of this knowledge. We'll be glad to interact with all of you and take it forward. Because as you say, each one of us, as Uncle said, are doing it in our own humble way. And cumulatively, it adds up to all these big words like Vishwaguru, big words like Vasudeva Kutupat. All these are nice words, very important words. But each of us have to contribute our bit to it. That is when it collectively adds up. The, the macro picture happens only when many, many granular micro pictures cohesively happen. That's important. So each of us have to do our own bits to make this cohesive macro picture happen. It's a long journey. It's not a journey of just one lifetime. As you see, we're talking about a journey of two million, two millennia. And more. And more. So it's how many lifetimes? And we are fortunate in this lifetime to analyze this, discuss and share mutually with each other. That's the beauty of it. Is it fortunate that we are we have been born in a window where we we are given opportunity uh, and a platform to be able to sit and dwell. I mean, this is like some of the old conferences, like when we talk about Veda Vyasa having compiled the Veda, where all the rishis came together. So they, there was a period when it was conducive for people to get together and ruminate and think and work. So similarly, we are today in that uh, kind of a space and time. And we also have a beautiful platform in the form of HUA. So really uh, request all of you to uh, encourage and provide all the encouragement to keep this platform going and growing so that a lot more of us can get together and uh, uh, keep this knowledge available for future generations as well. And we thank people like Vikramji to sort of so earnestly come for each one of our webinars and courses, and bring this whole host of family members and friends to join this so that there's a cumulative effort that's happening all over. That's what's the beauty of it. All of us have to pull the chariot, the ratha, ratotsava together. It cannot be done by just a few people alone. It, it's a cumulative effort. It's a juggernaut. It, it is. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for all the lovely things you have put in the chat. And we really look forward to interacting with all of you one-on-one uh, -on -one during the uh, coming course. So please register for the course. Look forward to interacting with you. And this uh, interaction that we have had now will be put up in the, in the website, available for... In case you want to share it with some of your friends, you can share it for them to see this so that they also can be enthused to get interest to know more about the Hindu civilization in the coming days, weeks, months, and years ahead of us. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Ankurji. Thank you all of you to have coming. Namaste. 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 Namaste.